Well, good morning. Good morning to you all. Welcome to Hudson First United Methodist Church online worship service. And I welcome you all. I'm so blessed to be able to sit and worship with you today. And I'm so thankful that you joined us in worship. <clears throat> My name is Pastor Brian Comiskey, and I'm leading the service today. Grace and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is also to be able to come together in this way. I always give thanks every Sunday when we do this service uh, because we have the blessing of technology, something that uh, we can do right here, right now. It doesn't have to be with a big studio or anything like that. It's just an amazing opportunity for us as Christians, as believers, as advocates for Jesus Christ, uh, for those who are trying to spread the word of the gospel. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity. So I give you thanks for being here is what I'm saying. We are focusing a little bit on, well, our theme today is sorrow. And so I, given that it's Lent, I pray that your Lent is going very well. I pray that whatever you may have decided to give up, uh, your, uh, whatever you are in that journey, wherever you are, I pray that it is going well. I pray for strength for you. And uh, um, just pray that everything is going, uh, whatever that struggle is, you know, that's the point of it. Or if you've decided to take something on, and that is just as good, I believe it's a wonderful thing to take something on for Lent as well. I think it's wonderful to add something to your life that's going to bless others, and that's awesome. So anyway, let's uh, go to our worship service today. I don't really have any announcements unless you just want to Take a peek at this extravaganza. The Hudson United Churches are getting together to put on an egg hunt April 1st. It's not a it's not a um, it's not a joke. It's not an April Fool's Day joke. It is happening and over at the high school at 12:30 p.m. Uh, be there by the gates when the gates open and the egg hunt is at one o'clock. So we're gonna work together. It's amazing how many things that the United Hudson Churches, we're all different denominations, yet we're working together. It's an amazing thing, especially with things seeming so divided in our country and in our world that um, in here in our little community where uh, the churches are coming together in unity and uh, just to help bless our community as much as we can, to bless the children, try to bring Jesus to others, to the children. Anyway, it's a wonderful thing. So let's go to the Lord and worship today as we go to our call to worship. Welcome again. Welcome again, everybody. When the world is dark and full of sorrow, God will open our eyes to light. When all we hear is of pain and loss, God will open our ears to truth. When we feel unable to come forth, God will animate our souls. Come and worship the one who makes us whole. Praise God who raises us back to life. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. And let's go to our opening hymn this morning. And this hymn today is a uh, open my eyes that I may see. How appropriate is that? So uh, let's go to our opening hymn and the words will be up on the screen. Let's sing together. Raise our voices to the Lord this morning.
Good singing. Well done. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, who created us in your image, we are grateful for all that you have done for us, for all that you are doing in us, for all that you will do through us. Lord, open our eyes to see your presence among us, moving in powerful ways at a time and at all times and in all places. Lord, open our ears to hear familiar words in new ways, ways that will change us and challenge us to become the people you created us to be. Lord, please grant us the power and the courage to come out and reveal our talents in your name, to reveal the person that you want us to be. Help us to move from the darkness to the light in Jesus Christ, that we may serve you by serving others, that we may lift up, lift you up, lift up your love, lift up your life as Jesus was raised and resurrected from the dead, Lord. Resurrect our hearts, our souls, our minds, our spirits. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen. Well, let's, thank you for praying with me. <laughs> well, uh, let's go over to our first scripture reading. If you'll join me in that. Isaiah 53, verses one through six. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here ends our first scripture reading. May the Lord add his blessing to the hearing and the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Let's uh, take some time to pray together. This is the time when we go to the Lord in prayer and lift up our thoughts and our minds and think about those who need our prayer. And there is so much to pray for. And the Lord knows what we need. Absolutely. We don't, we do need to lift up our, our prayers. So we do need to speak them. Although the Lord is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and knows exactly what we need. What could we ever pray for that the Lord doesn't already know what we need? He knows us better than we know ourselves. So but we still lift up our voices. We still lift up our thoughts to the Lord with those who need our prayer. And it's important that we do so. So let's think about those for a moment who need our prayer, the situations that need our prayer, the people who are fighting for their lives and their freedom in places like Ukraine and places around the world, people who have gone through the earthquakes and the terrible uh, disasters, nat natural disasters and man-made disasters those here in our country who have suffered from uh, different uh, storms on the coasts, people who are dealing with um, different uh, situations like homelessness, hunger, people who are hungry for the truth, people who are desperate in their minds, who are imbalanced with whatever mental issues that they're having. And if people don't know what that's like, it's, um, and not that I've gone through it, but having to deal with many people in my position uh, and to be around people who are getting help in that way, 
it is so hard for them. So help, remember those who are struggling mentally uh, and spiritually, of course, who for some reason they don't want to get to know who the Lord is. They don't want anything to do with religion. They don't believe in God, whatever it is. And they have their reasons. Whether it's uh, from abuse from somebody who was a super religious person or somebody who, uh, well, I can't think of anything right now, but anyway, you get the point. <laughs> so, But we pray for those who don't know what they need, but it really is the Lord. We pray that they may find that, that they may find their way to Jesus Christ and um, the Lord leads them to him that they may find that peace that surpasses all understanding. Well, anyway, let's take a moment of silence as we lift up those who are in need of our prayer this morning. Lord, he said, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We rejoice in the one God. We believe in one God. You, Lord, are one. You are divine love and divine wisdom in perfect union. There is no division in you, Lord. We look to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to guide our lives. And we turn to you in all that we do, Lord, in all that we say, in all that we think, in all that we try to accomplish, Lord. There's nothing that we could ever do on our own that could ever be accomplished. The way of man is temporary. The way of God is is fulfillment and eternal. Lord, we turn to you with our prayers this morning that we may lift up the people that are needing you, Lord, that are needing healing, that are needing comfort, that are needing the easement from the pain, whether that's spiritual pain, mental pain, or physical, whether they're in a hospital, whether they're at home, whether they're feeling alone, they don't know where to turn. They don't know that anybody cares, Lord. Help them to find that help. Help them to find somebody to help them and help us to find them. Help us to know what to do. Guide us, Lord. Help us to open ourselves up to what you need us to do and all that you need us to do, Lord. We've come a long way in our Lenten journey. For so many of us, we know where the scriptural road will take us and we will walk triumphantly into Jerusalem, eat a supper with Jesus, watch as he's taken from the garden and brought before the authorities. and We weep at the foot of the cross as he speaks words of love, forgiveness in the midst of that torturing pain. We wail at the tomb. But we have the story of Lazarus, Lord, who died. His sisters, Mary and Martha, have confidence that he could have been healed, but they didn't think that he would be raised from the dead. Well, that's part of our problem, Lord. We want to have confidence in the healing and restorative power in your name, the power of Jesus. But we cannot escape this fear that we have. The fear of our arch enemy, death. Jesus' proclamation of eternal life is real. And how many times did he say, fear not? 
We need to let go of our fear. We need to walk in faith, in life, in the reassurance that the Lord has revealed eternity to, uh, to us by his resurrection. That promise of God that a mansion is being prepared for us, that the Lord is going before us to prepare that place that we may be with him forever in peace, harmony, joy, and happiness. We come out of our place where we dwell in the darkness. Can we risk believing in Jesus? Yes, absolutely. We take the risk. We go to Jerusalem. We go to the cross. We go to the tomb. And we experience the resurrection. And we rejoice. What was once from sorrow is now in joy. And we give thanks. In Jesus' name we pray as we say the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you again for praying with me, and what a blessing that is. I'm so thankful for you for praying together. So. Well, shall we move on in our service? We're going to go to our second scripture reading. It is John uh, chapter 11, it's, we're going to do 17 through 45, and it is the story, well, much of the story of, um, of Lazarus and coming forth from the tomb and Jesus' arrival. So let's read this together. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but oh, I already said that. <laughs> when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house Comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to go to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, 
She fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. for He has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When Jesus had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was thinking, um, I sometimes tell a little story of like a lighthearted story or something like that, but I decided to skip that today because we are talking about sorrow and probably not good timing to tell a joke, but if there, <laughs> we, we're dealing with emotions, you know, we all have one thing in common as humans, if nothing else, it's emotions. The most important is the emotion of happiness, I think. Psalm 16 says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At that right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So could happiness be the purpose of life? If we think about how relatively short we live on this earth compared to an eternity in heavenly bliss. And not to mention the fact that we're not always going to go through unhappiness in this life. You know, not too many people try to get to be unhappy because that's not the normal state of, of where we're supposed to be. Our state of happiness is where we're always trying to get to. We're, we're always striving toward happiness. So it's not too far-fetched that happiness is the purpose of our life. And, and I get it. Somebody might argue that, well, that's a selfish way to think of it. That's a selfish view. To think that the purpose of my life is to be happy, that I might be fulfilled. No, no, no. The purpose of life is to worship God. Or the purpose of life is to serve others. But the truth is, we are created by God to be truly happy because we are giving, because we are serving others, because we are loving our neighbors and showing kindness. That is true happiness. When we are loving with reckless abandonment. That's happiness. 
We don't have it because we're serving ourselves. And somebody might be thinking right now, well, I thought you said this is a message about sorrow. Well, don't worry, I'm getting there. <laughs> There's plenty of time to be sad. But that's just it. When we love like that, when we love with that abandonment, we are being vulnerable. When we love so deeply, it's inevitable that we will be hurt deeply because the other side of joy is sorrow. But sorrow is a part of life. And just like it's not selfish to be happy, it's not selfish to be sad either. You might think about maybe an old man who is bitter and angry. And that's how his life is. And he's always complaining about everything and he's a curmudgeon. And you know, when somebody asks him, what are you so upset about? And he answers, because, because of all the fools out there. The world's full of fools. Well, yeah, everybody knows that. <laughs> but you know what? Not everybody's so upset all the time about it. Not everybody's going around so angry about it. Why are you so angry? And if you dig down into this man's life, you might find that he perhaps something very sad, tragic happened to him. Maybe he lost his father when he was a boy. Maybe his dad died and he was told to put on a brave face and not to cry and don't be selfish. Crying will only upset your mother. How awful, you know? And that's, that happens, unfortunately. No wonder these people can be angry. It's not selfish to grieve. It's healthy. It's healthy to let yourself be sad. Even Jesus in our scripture today was sad, wasn't he? It says, Jesus wept. Supposedly the shortest scripture, right? It's okay to grieve. And it's also good to let others be sad too. You know, we could say, hey, cheer up. Well, why not say, go ahead and be sad. It's okay. I wanted to mention a guy named Dan Millman. Maybe you know Dan Millman. He's a black belt in Aikido and he wrote books and he's into martial arts. And in this one book that he wrote, No Ordinary Moments, it's called A Peaceful Warrior's Guide to Daily Life. And in this book, he writes about sorrow. And he says, as in all emotional issues, the first step in dealing with sorrow involves complete acceptance of it. He says, embrace your sorrow the way you would a small child. Hold it, feel it, go completely into it. Because the ability to cry is one of God's gifts. Now let's not be too quick to judge, right? When we know of somebody who seems angry all the time that there's always something they're upset about. We might not know the whole story. When we talk about this man, Dan Millman, about Aikido, it reminded me of another man. Um, his name's Terry Dobbs, and he was an Aikido master, you know, the martial arts Aikido. And he was an expert in conflict resolution. And he told the story of an experience he had and what he learned from it. And I'm not... Well, what I want to do is tell it from his point of view as he wrote the story. And he said, the train clanked and rattled through the suburbs of Tokyo. And it was a drowsy spring afternoon. Our car was comparatively empty. There were a few housewives with their kids. There were some old folks going shopping. And I gazed absently at the drab houses and the dusty head grows that were going by. We pulled up to a station and the doors opened and suddenly the afternoon quiet was shattered by a man 
who came aboard and he was bellowing violent, incomprehensible curses. And the man staggered into our car and he was wearing laborer clothing and he was big and he was drunk and he was dirty. He began to scream and, and screaming, he swung at a woman holding a baby and the blow sent her spinning into an elderly couple, into the lap of an elderly couple. And it was a miracle that the baby was unharmed and that she was unharmed. Of course, terrified, the elderly couple jumped up and scrambled to the other end of the car. And the laborer aimed a kick at the old woman and she just barely got out of the way as she retreated to the back of the car just being missed by that blow. So this enraged the drunk that he grabbed the metal pole that was right in the middle of the train car and he started to pull on it, try to rip it out of, out of the ground and from the ceiling. He's trying to wrench it from the stanchion. He said, I could see that one of his hands was cut and bleeding and the train lurched ahead. And the passengers were frozen with fear. And then there was me. I stood up. I was young then, like 20 years old. I was in good shape. I'd been putting in a solid eight hours of Aikido training nearly every day. And I had been doing that for the past three years. I like to throw and to grapple, he said. And he said, I thought it was tough. The trouble was my martial skill was untested in actual combat. And if you know anything about Aikido, as students of Aikido, we were not allowed to fight. Aikido, my teacher had said again and again, is the art of reconciliation. He said, whoever has the mind to fight has broken his connection with the universe. If you try to dominate people, you are already defeated, he said. We study how to resolve conflict, not how to start it. I listened to his words. I tried hard. I even went so far as to cross the street to avoid what's called the chimpira, the pinball punks who lounged around the train stations. My forbearance exalted me. I felt both tough and holy. In my heart, however, I wanted an absolute legitimate opportunity whereby I might save the innocent by destroying the guilty. And this is it, I said to myself, this is my chance. And so getting to my feet, I stood up, people are in danger, and if I don't do something fast, they're probably going to get hurt. Well, here we go, we have the drunk man, and seeing me stand up, the drunk recognized the chance to focus his rage. Aha, he said, a foreigner. You need a lesson in Japanese manners, he said. I held on lightly to the, com the com commuter strap ahead, and I gave him a slow look of disgust and dismissal. I plan to take this turkey apart, but he had to make the first move. I wanted him mad, so I pursed my lips and I blew him an insolent kiss. All right, he hollered, you're gonna get a lesson. And he gathered himself up for a rush at me and the split second before he could move, somebody shouted, hey! It was ear splitting. And I remember the strangely joyous lilting quality of it. As though you and a friend had been searching diligently for something and he suddenly stumbled upon it. Hey! <laughs> well, I wheeled to my left and the drunk spun to his right. We both stared down at a little old Japanese man. 
He must have been well into his 70s. This tiny gentleman sitting there, immaculate in his kimono. He took no notice of me, but beamed delightedly at the laborer as though he had the most important, most welcome secret to share. Come here, the old man said in an easy vernacular, beckoning to the drunk. Come here and talk with me. He waved his hand lightly. The big man followed as if on a string, and he planted his feet belligerently in front of the old gentleman and roared above the clacking wheels, why the hell should I talk to you? The drunk now had his back to me, and if he had moved his elbow so much as a millimeter, I'd drop him in his socks. Well, the old man continued to beam at the laborer. What you been drinking? He asked, his eyes sparkling with interest. I've been drinking sake, the laborer bellowed. And it's none of your business. And flecks of spittle spattered the old man. And he said, oh, that's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. You see, I love sake too. Every night, me and my wife, you know, she's 76, you know, we warm up a little sake, take it out into the garden, and we sit on an old wooden bench. We watch the sun go down. We look to see how our persimmon tree is doing. You know, my great grandfather planted that tree. And we worry about whether it will recover from those ice storms we had last winter. Our tree had done better than I expected. Though, especially when you consider the poor quality of the soil. It is gratifying to watch when we take our sake and we go out to enjoy the evening and even when it rains. And he looked up at the laborer, his eyes twinkling. As he struggled to follow the old man's conversation, the drunk's face began to soften. His fists slowly unclenched. Yeah, he said, I love persimmons too. His voice trailed off. Yes, said the old man, smiling. And I'm sure you have a wonderful wife. No, replied the laborer. My wife died. Very gently, swaying with the motion of the train, the big man began to sob. I don't got no wife. I don't got no home. I don't got no job. I'm so ashamed of myself. And tears rolled down his cheeks. A spasm of despair rippled through his body. And now it was my turn, standing there in well-scrubbed, youthful innocence, my make this world safe for democracy righteousness. I suddenly felt dirtier than he was. Then the train arrived at my stop, and as the doors opened, I heard the old man cluck sympathetically. My, my, he said, that is difficult. What a predicament indeed. Sit down here and tell me about it. And as I headed out the door of the train, I turned my head one last time for a look, and the laborer was sprawled on the seat, his head in the old man's lap. The old man was st softly stroking the filthy, matted hair. And as the train pulled away, I sat down on a bench. What I had wanted to do with muscle had been accomplished with kind words. I had just seen Aikido tried in combat, and the essence of it was love. I would have to practice the art with an entirely different spirit, and it would be a long time before I could speak about the resolution of conflict. What a story. There's something so pure about releasing that emotion. Something pure about somebody allowing somebody to release it. Something so cleansing. When Jesus wept over his friend Lazarus, it's such a pure moment. Not just for Jesus, 
But for all of us, when you think about how Jesus healed, in what ways Jesus healed, placing his hands on people and so forth, this, when Jesus wept, it was another way he healed by showing us it's okay to be sad. It's okay to weep, to be cleansed of that overwhelming emotion. And of course, it doesn't mean that the sadness goes away with the tears. We are still sad. But Jesus had gathered together a small group of 12 disciples, right? And they themselves were amazed that they were ordinary people called on to do extraordinary things. And they did so much together. And then what did Jesus say? He told them that he was going to leave them. And they were extremely sad. Very sorrowful. Jesus talked to them about it. He said, you now have sorrow. And when a woman is in labor, she is in sorrow because her hour has come. But when the child is born, she doesn't remember the sorrow anymore because as a child has been born into the world, that joy overcomes the sorrow. And he said, I am leaving you and you will have sorrow, but you will see me again. Sometimes we need to go through sorrow to grow spiritually and to experience life more fully. And it was just after these words of Jesus that he said to them, you are sad now, but soon you will rejoice with a joy that no one can take from you. What is this joy that Jesus talks about? When Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, he said to Martha, your brother will rise. And Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked her. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. And when Jesus called Lazarus, he brought him back to life. And we look up at Jesus dying on the cross and we weep. We're in despair and we sit in the darkness as Jesus lay in the tomb for three days and we don't know what's going to happen. And then suddenly, here is our Lord, alive, resurrected from the tomb. This is the joy that nobody can take from you. The revelation that there is no death. There is only life. And yes, there's transition And there is sadness when we have to be apart from our loved ones. Even Jesus displayed that for us. But there is no death. And our sins are washed clean. The one who lives by believing in me will never die. And it's not just the name Jesus Christ that saves us. It's the divine love which Jesus is. It's the divine wisdom which he is. And when we live by that, like that old Japanese gentleman did in the story, and and mesh it into our being, we are made whole. We are brought back to life, even in times of sorrow. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Amen. Amen. Well, I thank you once again for uh, joining us in service today. And um, we're going to finish off our our service with uh, singing and singing out to the Lord. And we are in Lent, so... um, It's called, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. And you might not be familiar with the song, but you'll recognize the melody, I believe. So let's lift our voices up to the Lord this morning 
with our closing hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I love that. I almost started it again. But. Well, thank you again for joining us in service, and God bless you all. I'm so uh, just a joy to, to be able to worship with you, and I thank you for joining us once again. Go into this world carrying the light of Christ into the darkness. Go with hearts full, eyes that see, ears that hear. Receive God's love and care. And share that love and care with others. Go with eyes reflecting God's light and hands open to share it. That others may come forth from the tomb and be revealed and revamped and regenerated in Christ's name. May you walk in the life of Christ throughout all the days that you have into eternity. Amen. Take care now. We'll see you next time. We'll see you soon, I hope. God bless you all, and um, thanks again for joining us. See you next time. Bye-bye.